Hello and welcome to those of you that are starting to arrive. Um, we'll just give it a moment to allow uh, some more people to get here and then we will begin this Southwest Marine Ecosystems uh, webinar on fish and reptiles. Excellent. So um, we'll get we'll get going. Um, I'm just going to um, welcome you before I hand you over to today's speakers. So um, my name's Kathy, and here at the Marine Biological Association, we are hosting today's webinar. I'm very pleased to be doing so. Um, this is the second that we're hosting. Uh, so the first one on the seashore and seabed by Keith um, is now available on YouTube, and I will put the link in the chat uh, shortly. We are on this one today, uh, led by Doug on fish and reptiles, and then we have got one on Friday um, on marine and coastal birds. So I'm just going to uh, give you a little bit of information about the Marine Biological Association while you're here. We've got some events coming up um, in the coming months. Um, you can see our full events calendar on our website, but here's just a few highlights. Um, um, and things that you can share with your network um, or possibly even come and attend yourself. Um, so I'll let you have a little look at that yourself. Um, we are also a membership organization. Um, and so we're always welcoming uh, new members to come and be part of the community um, to be able to enjoy some of the benefits, including um, the Marine Biologist magazine, which is published quarterly. So if you're not yet a member, um, but you're interested, then again, please check out the website. I will post a link in the chat shortly. So on to today's uh, webinar. So the brief timetable of today is that we're going to start with Doug in a moment um, on fish. And then at half past one, we'll have Simon, Dr. Simon Thomas on uh, talking about elasmobranchs. And then Doug will be back with us at 10 to 2 uh, to talk about turtles, followed by Q&A. So if you would like to ask a question today, there's going to be two ways to do that. One is you can put it in the Q&A, um, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you'll be able to type your question in. The second way is that when we get there, you can use the raise your hand icon and we can ask you to unmute and you can actually ask either Doug or Simon your question live. Um, for observations um, and things that might be useful for the reporting, if you can pop those in the chat, then that would be excellent. Um, so I think that that is all for me for the moment. Um, I will pass over to um, Doug now and change his name spelling. As I've just seen your comment in the chat, Tuck. <laughs> Apologies. So I shall pass over to you and uh, see you soon. Okay. Oh. <coughs> right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome again to a review of what's been happening in the Southwest. Um, one thing to start with, I've got very little data this year on small pelagic fish, uh, in part due <coughs> to the fact that the Peltic crew, uh, cruise, the CFAS uh, pelagic survey cruise, which normally covers the whole of the Western Channel, Western approaches and up to the Welsh coast, was cut down from 35 days to 10 days this year due to technical problems and weather. So virtually no data from that, which is usually a useful source on sardines, anchovies, all kinds of things. So unfortunately, that data is not available at the moment. So going on to the <coughs> uh, larger fish. In fact, John Dory. Uh, John Dory this year is a reasonably common fish, but not so many around this year. But what there were tended to be larger. So um, a few quite large John Dory caught by the angling charter boats. And this beautiful example is one of them. In the same family, the sailfin or silver or uh, dory is one that's spreading up from Africa. First ones in Britain back in the mid, nine, mid to late 90s, but still um, pretty unusual. And usually get about one every four years. This is the second year we've had one. And in fact, it's the 17th. Oh, sorry, meant to say about the Dory's, the John Dory. 
those larger ones went up to 2.6 kilos, so pretty large. The South, the South Inn or Silver Dory, um, this was the 17th for, for Britain that I'm aware of. So quite an unusual fish, but becoming commoner. Quite a few in the Sillies area. And this one I just got as off Cornwall. I think last year's was off Plymouth. Seahorses, I uh, tend to think of them as a summer visitor um, coming into the inshore waters when the storms have died down. Get the two species, uh, the short snouted or hippocampus hippocampus. There's been a pregnant male, obviously. And the uh, spiny or maned or long snouted hippocampus uh, gutulatus. Sorry. Uh, this year, both species were recorded throughout the year and along much of the south coast from, from Bournemouth at least to the Fowland beyond. Uh, also, it's interesting, they were there all through the year. There wasn't the old pattern of first starting to appear May, June. They were found right through the winter. And reasonable numbers at various places along. One in Torquay, unfortunately, met an unfortunate fate. A juvenile in November, so I was saying about being around all year. It was found inside a pollock. When an angler opened up his pollock, there was the, the uh, juvenile seahorse in its uh, stomach. So showing around at the time and also one of their predators, if they're unwary, can be pollock. The gurnards, so-called because they grunt a lot. Gurnard being uh, gurnard or something being the French for grunter or snorer. Uh, the first record of the streaked gurnard for Southampton water. Uh, these tend to be thought of by divers as being fairly uncommon, at least used to be, but they're turning up much more around the Southwest and they were fairly regular in small, very small numbers uh, in trawls, trawling, uh, commercial trawling in offshore deeper waters. So first street gurnard. And this, despite its color, is a gray gurnard. And this is the British record, uh, angling record uh, gray gurnard at 1.16 kilos. And it was caught 20 miles south of start point. So that's a nice gray gurnard, very neat pattern, gives them away, regardless of what, whether they're gray or red, you've got that very neat white belly, white lateral, scaled lateral line, darker back, patterning on the snout's quite nice and fairly longish snout. It's a gray gurnard and they can be gray or red. <laughs> uh, onto the Ceranids. Uh, Ceranids are widespread group worldwide and quite diverse, but unusual in British waters. And the, com the coma, Serranus cabrilla, is one of the smallest groupers. So we do get groupers in British waters, but they are the smallest ones, only going up <coughs> to around about a kilo in weight at maximum. Uh, used to turn up from time to time. I used to say, oh, about one every four years. And then it came one most years, and lately it's got much commoner. In fact, this year, lots of angling boats were catching them. So in 2021, there were two in Guernsey and one off in Bigbury with the records I had. This year, it was, uh, sorry, for 2022, at least 17. Quite a lot around the Channel Islands but also uh, around <coughs> uh, Plymouth area, out hands deep um, into Big Bree Bay, and also the one first photograph taken underwater that I'm aware of, of one in this country, which was at the busies of, the, um, of Falmouth. So that is an occurrence 
the a species that seems to be increasing quite a bit in British waters. Another largely tropical subtropical family are the sea breams. And this is an unusual sea bream. Most are pretty event thick, but the boog uh, is a semi-pelagic one. And they, in the past, they have been found shoaling in Mounts Bay off Penzance during the winter. This was one that was caught off Plymouth back in April. So this uh, one, quite a few records this year of the boog. But please do send me any coming in so we can keep a track on what's happening with them. Uh, Cooch's bream. This actually is a photo of the record uh, Cooch's bream back in 2002, caught on 1st of January 2002, when it was about, that one was about a kilo. Well, in June, Loki Adventures out of Penzance, one of their anglers, they caught a lot of large uh, cooches bream, and one of them caught the record boat caught one at 4.28 kilos. So in the past 20 years, the size of them being caught in British waters has more than doubled. Up until, um, I think the camera was wet when this one was taken, but still it's a useful photo. Uh, up until 1996, records <coughs> around, mainly off Cornwall, but around Britain, uh, for Cooch's bream were pretty low, and there were a few more, not many more, for this species, the Pandora. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Very similar <coughs> in general appearance to Cooch's. Um, or oh, one thing I can go back quickly and look at. With the cooches, it's also known in the States as red porgy, but the American ones do not have the white tips to the tails that the European ones do. So rather similar, but without the white tips to the tail, different head profile. And if you get a look at it, right, very different dentition, small sharp teeth in the Pandora, big crushing teeth in Cooch's bream. But the Pandora, as I say, <coughs> was turning up regularly um, until 1996. But since then, only a few records, whilst Cooch's has gone on to become um, <coughs> much commoner. In fact, Bob Earl was out on a kayak in uh, Sorkham Harbour, Kingsbridge Estuary, and he came across two guys out in their boats in estuaries fishing. Went up to one. What's he fishing for? Cooch's bream. Went half a mile over. Somebody, another guy. Oh, gilt head bream. So both are getting quite common in the Southwest and fairly good numbers of them being caught these days. Uh, this is a RAS. Most people are familiar with the standard Ballon, Cuckoo, um, Corkwing, Gold Cine, Rock Cook, and the rest. Uh, but this is one that's not encountered that regularly. Uh, <coughs> Mike uh, Markey has been doing a bit of study on these. And the first were called, recorded by Jonathan Cooch after whom Cooch's Bream's named, uh, two in the 19th century, but no more for 127 years, until three in 1986, singles in 1992 and 2011, and then 2016, two records. And this year, sorry, 2022, another two records, one from the south coast of Cornwall and the other from the northwest of Cornwall. So it's a species that is turning up more and different methods. This photo <coughs> was taken off South Cornwall uh, back in 2016. Um, but
But the one off Lou was caught by an angler. The one off Godrevi was in a crab pot. So that is extending its range and increasing numbers. Uh, in this year's report, I'll be leaving these little fellows to uh, Lynn Bordock, who's got much more experience with them than me. But briefly, um, with the gobies, um, it was generally considered when they're first described by Miller in 1974, that Cooch's uh, goby was an inshore one, particularly estuaries, an inshore, and Stevens was a deeper one offshore. But in the last few years, getting quite a lot more Stevens gobies turning up inshore, in shallow coastal waters, and um, Sally Sharrett, Glynn, and uh, Paul Naylor, recording quite a lot of these, and I believe Matt got some down in uh, Cornwall. And Paul actually got photos of them breeding with the eggs, the male here guarding the eggs in a crevice in Plymouth Sound in last May. So what was considered a deeper water goby now breeding inshore. I'll briefly deal with tuna. I believe Libby will be dealing with them in much more detail tomorrow. So just briefly, the um, blue, uh, bluefin tuna were first picked up in Southwest waters in July, but was still around into February of this year. And they were found from the Sillies uh, right um, up into, well, into Devon. Uh, there were plenty about, quite widespread, but there weren't the large shoals that there had been in previous years. The numbers were pretty high, as we'll see in a minute. Also, Simon was telling me that um, a lot of the shoals also contained smaller uh, tuna as well, kind of half grown ones. So some younger ones there. Here, of course, you can see this is from uh, Duncan Jones down with Marine Discovery in Penzance. And it's obviously they're feeding on a load of bait fish. You can see the little ones leaping out of the water just in front there. Uh, could be sand eels or they might just be uh, white bait of some sort. What has been going on the last two years, for, um, 2021 was basically a trial, and 2022 really got going, is the catch and release tagging or chart, which is uh, organized by CFAS, and to look at what the stocks are and what's happening with the um, bluefin tuna in our waters, the Atlantic bluefin tuna. This is a photo by Ross Parham on uh, Spot On, one of the boats taking part in this program. It's all run by angling charter boats. And the overall summary for the year, 25 vessels, between them got over 4,000 hours of work looking for tuna. Um, and they actually got hold of 1,100 of which 1,090 were tagged. It's all alongside tag, measure, and it, well, alongside and measure, and if you can get a tag in. Sometimes it's difficult to get that tag in, therefore um, it doesn't always, hence the difference in numbers there. But a very successful program. I believe it's going to be carrying on this year as well. Simon may have more information on that than I do. But uh, yeah, 25 boats from East Devon, and not so if Dorset was involved as well, right down to the far west of Cornwall. So a major survey being carried out by anglers paying to go out on the trips to keep the charter boats going and getting all this information. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't got a picture, 
but also on the tuners, 1st of August, an albacore tuner. This is a smaller one, still goes a couple of kilos, uh, but with very long pectoral fins, was filmed swimming around inside Mayflower Marina in Plymouth. So that's uh, one. And there was a boat actually a few years back going out of St. Ives, going down to Biscay fishing for them. And uh, because they're not covered under the tags, uh, tax for the bluefin. So albacore tuna was one that has been seen in British waters, generally further south, but. Uh, uh, the Atlantic Bonito, this is a juvenile. The adults look rather different. This is one collected during the uh, Peltic survey last year. And some years we get large numbers, other years only a few. And this year I've only heard of one or two being caught in Southwest waters. Ocean sunfish. I haven't got any um, relative uh, data on these compared to last year yet, but uh, they were around from Scilly right up to Devon from May to September. Now a few of the rarities that turned up. <laughs> a moray eel. This one was caught southwest of Newlyn in May and was the second one for Cornwall since 1900. So quite a large one there, 3.6 kilos. And they have turned up from time to time around here. Second proven case for Cornwall since 1900. Uh, we get two types of scorpion fish, the black or small scaled. Sorry. The black, anyway, the Scorpinus porcus, which has been four records of. Scorpinus scrofa, the red scorpion fish, has um, occurred most years, only a few, but a few most years. And there was one caught by a trawler working out of Brixham in April. Uh, these, unlike the sea scorpions you find on the shore, are venomous both the opercular spines, but particularly the front, or front dorsal spines do carry quite a nasty venom, but much favored by the French for use in boulevards. Talking of a venomous species, we now go to a toxic species. All the puffer fish are, um, have toxins in parts of their body. You may know a fugu can be eaten, if it's prepared by a chef who's been trained for four years. Um, the skin, the liver are uh, supposed to be extremely toxic. Uh, the gonads, mildly toxic, and it's going to be eaten as a bit of a dare or as a booster. But uh, two, once again, two species occurring in Britain. This is the ocean pufferfish, Lagocephalus lagocephalus, which turns up probably two in every two every three two in three years but some years you'll get 10 20 turning up so most years it's the none or just the odd one but some years you can get up to 10 or more being turned up mainly of course occasionally caught in uh, trawl nets otherwise stranded on beaches like this one at town beach in november Uh, there was a small sturgeon found stranded on the beach at Westward Ho in North Devon. Uh, <clears throat> however, looking at the photos, it was a sturlet, a small non-native species, which is frequently kept in garden ponds. Whether it was one that died and been disposed of or had unfortunately escaped from a pond due to flooding, we won't know. But uh, we do get Acipensa sturio and Acipensa oxyrhynchus occurring off the uh, southwest coast. In fact, it does look as if there could be a major feeding ground for adolescent sturgeon to the south of, De of Devon and southeast Cornwall, but none that I'm aware of having been encountered in 2022. 
I did say I'd leave Elasma Branks to <laughs> Simon, but I couldn't resist pinching this one from him. In, on the 12th of March, I was asked to give a talk to the Marine Stranding Network of Cornwall Wildlife Trust about stranded fish and the important information we can get from them. So I went through a number of uh, species and ended up as a sideline, an off the cuff remark saying that <coughs> the Greenland shark, whilst thought of as being an Arctic species, one of the biggest ever, had been caught off the Isle of May in Scotland back in about 1864. But another one had been stranded in Northumberland. Uh, I think it was 2012, 26, 2012. Anyway, a few years back. And a friend had been talking to fishermen who said they'd seen a very large, brownish, very lazy, laid back shark with green eyes swimming around their boats. Now, both Paul Ganey, who passed me the report, and myself thought, well, that does sound like a Greenland shark, but they're not supposed to be down here. Anyway, at the end of the meeting, I said, well, do look out in case there's a Greenland shark around. The next morning, this one was found by Rosie Woodruff of the ZSL on the beach in Newlyn. Uh, the photos prove it's a Greenland shark. Unfortunately, the tide took it out again. And when the people went down to collect the body, um, it had gone, but it was found subsequently by one of the boats out of New Lynn, brought ashore and taken in to the Cornwall Marine Pathology team at Falmouth for post-mortem. Um, I followed it up with uh, French uh, colleagues, and it turns out this shark, definitely the same one, the markings on the fins, had in fact stranded on rocks in Brittany. I think it was in the Ile de Wasson or Ashant region of Brittany on the 7th of March. It was stranded once, thrashed its way off the rocks, and then a week later was found up on the beach, dead on the beach in Cornwall. When it was post-mortemed, by the team here, <coughs> uh, James Barnett and his team in Cornwall, it was found to have meningitis. So that shark was stranded both in Brittany and here was suffering from meningitis. But it does show that we do get Greenland sharks in British waters. And of course, Greenland shark is one of the three largest predatory sharks in the world. Uh, it's a, nobody's measured at them in the biggest ones in great detail, but the largest are great white, or white as it should be called, white shark, six-gilled shark, which is also caught off Cornwall, and the Greenland. So three, well two, definitely two of the largest predatory sharks in the world occur around Cornwall. So with that, I think I'd better hand over to uh, Simon. Excellent, thank you very much, Doug. Um, we shall hand over to Simon. Whenever you're ready. I'm just going for it, right. Hi folks. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the anatomy branks in the WEC. Um, Can I just get you, Simon, just to stop sharing and share again, because we've got your notes and everything. Oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't, but we've got, we've got you um, in presenter view. Hold on one second. Um, let me show. Sorry, I've got two screens here. It gets very confusing. Doesn't it just? <laughs> I'm trying to see my, um, let me see. Hold on, where is my thing gone? Hold on one second and I will get here. If I can actually see my, um, should be there. Okay. Um, share screen, right, it should be. 
which one is it? Let's have a look. Go with this. Sorry, I'll have to go back with this one because I had that one set up. Um, slideshow from the beginning. Are you okay there? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, these are just some of the people who I work with. Um, I am reliant on anglers and charter skippers for a lot of my data. Um, I work with approximately 20 boats across the southwest and about six in the Celtic Sea. Um, we have recorded somewhere in the region of 106,000 blue sharks. Um, because of the Shark Angling Club of Great Britain, we go back to 1953. Uh, as part of the Pat Smith database, we also have about 3,000 poor beagles and around about 500 threshers. So uh, yeah, we do actually have a bit of um, a bit of coverage. Um, here's one of my favourite shark pictures. I know I showed it last year, but um, it's from Andy Orsop and Whitewater Charters. And this is taken in the Celtic deeps. Um, if you look closely on this one, you can see about seven or eight blue sharks milling around. Uh, blue sharks make up the majority of our, of our large pelagic sharks in the southwest. Um, they are bounded, their northern range is bounded by the, by the Celtic front, and their eastern range is not largely bounded by the position of the Ushant front, which sort of oscillates around um, start point. They do occasionally on warm summers cross it, but normally we find that is probably about as far east as they go. Um, and here's a lovely picture of a poor beagle. Um, one of our commonest, um, one of our commonest large sharks. Well, it did get very rare for a while. But in recent years, we've seen large numbers of them returning to the southwest. Last year was a bit of an oddity. Uh, they didn't really show off of, uh, of Devon and Cornwall or the Isle of Wight, but there were large numbers of females in the Celtic deeps. And also I spoke to a boat the other day and apparently in the um, separation zone of pool, there were large numbers of males and males, the males were around 80 to 120 pounds, but he had about 70. So um, it just shows you from year to year, these sharks are, you know, they have boundaries and they have regions they like to go and it does vary over space and time. Here we've got the catches for the large um, pelagic sharks. Um, Makos have been incredibly rare since about 1980. From 1980 to 2014, there was not a Mako recorded in UK waters until Andrew also caught one in the Celtic Deeps. That was quite a small fish, um, but in 2016, there was one hooked. Well, it was nominally um, nominally landed. It basically swam up, swam up to the boat out of interest. The skipper touched the trace, by which time it realised something was wrong and disappeared and straightened the hook. Um, we haven't, I've seen, I saw one back in 2008 out of Lou. Um, I've not, I've seen two in my lifetime. One was back in the heyday when they were on the manacles, which was the area where they were most common. And it was a very large fish, but I saw a small one off Lou. Um, Murray Collins, who is an excellent uh, judge of sharks, saw one by the radar boy off Lou last year. And there was another report of one about eight miles south of the one boy. Um, well, blue shark numbers, although much lower than in the 1950s, there are a lot more boats in the 1950s. Um, up till last year, the catch unit effort had been higher than it had been ever. Uh, last year, we did see a reduction in numbers, and I'll go into that a bit more detail uh, later. Threshers are an odd one. Uh, the traditional places where we get threshers uh, around about the Isle of Wight, there were very few last year. I think there was only 12, 12 hooked, uh, whereas the year before there was 70 odd. But interestingly, the, um, the threshers were more common off the Plymouth area. There were quite a few seen and quite a few caught, some of them surprisingly closely inshore. I mean, there were threshers caught just off Rain Head. One boat had three in a day. And there were others encountered in the grounds we normally go shark fishing. Poor beagles, we I think there was one pup caught in the southwest last year. So very few, it seemed to be very few large females entering our waters to pup. But um, there were numbers of these males east to start point. And the, the larger females seem to have been last summer. Um, west to northwest of Land's End, up into the Celtic Deeps. And the skippers fishing the Celtic Deeps saw large females for the first time in their memory, uh, which again illustrates, you know, these fish have fins and are mobile. 
Right, Blue Sharks, the catch per unit effort, nice little um, nice little model there, which is um, um, my delta log normal model, the catch per unit effort. There's a gap in the middle because the data is a bit, um, I can't really do as much as I'd like because it's basically um, monthly data. Um, last year was poor. Uh, the catch per unit effort was about half of what it was the year before. Um, there are some mitigating factors for it. One would be the hot weather. We had large, large time of last year, we had algal blooms. When you look back in the records, every time there's a big bloom event off um, the, the um, later in the season, they don't seem to mind diatoms quite so much, but later in the season, you get an absence of sharks and sharks totally disappeared from um, the Plymouth and Lou waters for eight days last summer, there wasn't a single one caught and the skippers were, were describing brown water. Um, again, look back through the records in uh, September 2000, there was a similar event and there wasn't a single blue shark caught. What there were was a lot of pups. Um, I, sometimes there were multiple ones around boats and these are newborns. It's something we haven't, we have seen recently, we didn't really see back in the day. We might see the old pregnant female, what we thought was pregnant, but the number of pups we've seen around recently is quite high. Most of them we don't actually catch, we just see them swimming around the chum bag. Uh, they're very sweet and very hungry. Right, here we have the algal bloom. Um, if you look on the left hand side, it's actually a, a model I've done of landings against environmental state so um and what it shows is the environment actually has a big effect on the number of blue sharks we see um probably greater than the catches that you know at this number we see around here seems more influenced by um environmental conditions and these include events in the sub um subpolar arctic um, than the number of catches they reg are registering from commercial boats and sorry, it's a bit of a blurry picture, but you can actually see one of the blooms last summer, uh, which basically sits over the top of our sharking grounds. And that's it just has a it reduces visibility in the water and b the bait fish don't like going in it. So the blue sharks tend to avoid it as well. Here we have from 1950s, uh, 1953 to current, what we have is the season when they're here. So you can see they're very seasonal. Um, the typically the first ones appear at the end of May and they disappear around about the second week in October. But one of the things you notice is their arrival is largely controlled by sea surface temperature. So warm years, we will see them a little bit earlier and years like 1963, they didn't actually appear till July, which I don't know if anyone here remembers the winter of 1963. It was pretty gruesome. Um, what you can see is before the 2000s, there were um, up to 2000, actually catches really deteriorated. Um, the sharks were scattered, um, few of them caught, lots of blank days, and that culminated in the worst year ever, which was 2000. Uh, what we've seen is since 2015 is a massive increase in the number of blue sharks uh, we've seen. The most, the largest number caught in a single day by an angling boat is a staggering 106, which was Robin Chapman out of Penzance. Um, this year it's much more patchy. The Penzance boats tend to get more than we do in Plymouth, but they get the highest caught was actually Kieran on Loki Adventures. He had 63, went out there the next day and had two from a different place. So it's very patchy depending on the algal bloom and the sea surface temperature. Um, we have started to see large males in the southwest, something that were very, very rare back in the day. In fact, um, back in, the only males we used to see were juveniles. Since about 2016, we have seen very large males. Uh, the biggest one I've seen is 242 pounds. That was by measured at the side of the boat. So take it or leave it. Put it this way, it was nearly 10 foot long. Um, there weren't as many last year, but they, they turned up on the same tides which seems to be typical. It's normally the big tides at the end of July, we start to see the big males. Davy Wren has a one on just under eight foot. Um, you always with it, you tell her about, because all the mature females and most of the immature females you get beforehand have all got bite marks on them and they're fresh. This year, there were very few males around. It's normally about 94% female. Um, this year it was 98. 
Um, this year was 89% immature and sub-adults, so the general size was smaller as well. So this year, the Ushant Front, the way the Ushant Front was set, we didn't really see them at uh, east of Stark Point. They also didn't venture inside, which is quite surprising given it was a warm year. And, th and that just might be a numbers thing, you know, it might just be there were fewer around, so they didn't need to spread out to actually utilise a resource. But um, as Doug's probably noticed and a few of the others, mackerel were nearly absent during the summer. Mackerel have gone from being a summer species now to a winter winter species. The sand was full of mackerel during December this year. So, uh, sea Area 7F, which basically covers North Cornwall and the um, Bristol Channel, you don't see many. They don't like that sort of very mixed water, um, but they were absent this year. I didn't hear of anyone actually catching one there. Um, but 7G, which is the Celtic front, there were very large numbers of them. And the demarcation zone is always the position of the Delta of the Celtic front. Hall beagles will cross it, blue sharks won't. Hall beagles. Um, we saw a big spike in them last year. Uh, they were absolutely everywhere. Um, this year, in the areas they had been, there was a lot less. Um, there were very few caught in Sea Area 7E or 7D. So that's sort of the channel going up to almost Brighton area. Um, the effort was still the same, so it was generally there were less around. Uh, they were virtually absent from South Devon and Cornwall last year. I didn't even hear of a lot of, I often get reports from the potters up off start, and they say that they actually come up and have a look at the pots. They're fairly, um, they are fairly curious creatures. The ones we did see, as I um, suggested before, was actually males, and they seem to sit offshore in the separation zone between the shipping lanes. Uh, one boat knew where they were and had 70. Um, the, the females, again, as I said, um, they were seen in, in the Celtic Sea, uh, mostly post-pupping. Uh, so they were seen off North Cornwall, North Devon, um, when they seemed to be gravid. And then they appeared off the Celtic deeps where they where they appear to have actually pupped somewhere. We don't quite know where that is. I haven't heard reports of large numbers of pups anywhere this year. Um, typically, they're found in similar areas to where we see the blue sharks. They prefer structure. So a lot of the poor beagles we see will be around reefs or around wrecks, but they're actually quite happy to come inshore. I mean, I've seen them off the off the Mewstone of Plymouth. Uh, as I mentioned here, I mean, you know, the, they have been very rare for a long time and there seem to be more numbers of them around in the last few years. It's as always with a high, highly migratory species, whether that's just, a, you know, they've relocated, whether that truly reflects um, stock recovery is very hard to say. Um, all I can say is that if last year there were so many around, it must be virtually the whole stock must have been in the UK. Fascinatingly, despite the fact that they've been absent for so long, they return to exactly the same areas every time. Um, one of the working theories is often you find them on the on the lee side of a reef, and they're normally around stones. And we think when the tide's running, they're actually resting on the bottom of the tide running over their gills. Um, skippers who know what they're doing, you can actually see them coming off the bottom when the tide's running. You can see them coming up and looking at the bait on, on the fish finder, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the juvenile fish was actually last year, um, but there was another one having a look at an anode out in July. Um, that's the only one I heard out of here. Pressures. Last year, there was an awful lot seen off Plymouth, which is very unusual. Um, typically, the threshers go up to the Isle of Wight, and they appear there in about July, probably the end of June. They're virtually uncatchable for two weeks. Uh, we're not quite sure why. They, they seem leaping but nobody catches one. Then all of a sudden on one day, they'll start to feed. Um, one angler fishing off Rame Head had three threshers in one day, which is ridiculous. I mean, that shouldn't happen. But what seemed to happen is they were in with the tuna shoals. So quite often during the chart program, they were actually chasing lures. Um, what we do know is that they migrate east to west during the autumn. So when they disappear from, um, from the Isle of Wight, you see them in Lime Bay a few weeks afterwards. Um, Doug will probably know some of the captures in Sprat Nets are typical. They appear off here around the same time, a few few days, a few weeks later, 
And during December, they're actually seen off, um, off Penzance. Uh, there have been some huge specimens caught in nets. So one, one was over a thousand pounds. They are very, very. They like chasing the lures during the chart program. The tuna lures typically they'll come up and have a look and just whop a lure with its tail. Um, I'm always scared they're going to foul up one in the tail, but so far that hasn't happened. But you know, considering I've never actually seen one in the flesh, and I spent a lot of time on boats and skipper on my own and whatever. I wasn't out much last year, so I didn't see one. So I'm very envious. Um, let's just look to, to it. There were two caught off Lou this year, um, one about 75 kilos and one late on um, um, of about 180 kilos. They were both down by the radar buoy, which is 14 miles southwest of Lou. Um, as I said, lots, lots chasing towed lures. But to give you an idea of how rare they are, I mean, the skipper I work with has never seen one in 30 years, and suddenly they're all over the place. Um, you know, he saw, he, I think he saw some like six in one day, which is just ridiculous. So it does seem to be um, Atlantic hotspot for threshers. Here's a lovely picture of one taken off the Isle of Wight. Uh, the colors on them are absolutely spectacular, and they're a very good guide to the health of the fish. Once they start to lose that sheen, you can tell that they're um, they're not doing well. The Isle of Wight fishery is very strict. They haven't boated a fish in 35 years and they do reoxygenate them. So they will actually tow them behind the boat until they're actually ready to go and then they'll let them go. Uh, they are very well looked after, but I, I have to get to the Isle of Wight to see these things jump in the bag because it must be absolutely spectacular. Makos, a species that is incredibly rare. I say I've been lucky enough to see two in the UK waters, but one was in 1985. Um, Murray Collins saw one um, um, wandering around in his slick. Um, he's a good enough uh, skipper to know what a mako looks like. All the other blue sharks um, in the slick cleared off and he just had this mako. Wasn't a monster, um, but it was a decent sized mako, probably about 100 kilos, something like that. Um, there was another which I haven't had confirmed, uh, <laughs> seen south of the radar, but um, south of E1. Um, apparently, it was predating on a dead cetacean, uh, which is possible. I mean, the reason I said it hasn't been concerned, um, confirmed is if you don't get up close, it's quite easy just to confuse them with a big male, a, a big blue shark. Um, but uh, there do seem to be some in the UK waters. Uh, the, uh, the biggest I've heard of, was, as I said, was a very large fish taken off the Celtic deeps. They're rarely seen in Europe. I suspect it probably crossed the Atlantic. <coughs> They've never been common in UK waters, but we used to get them in May, June and July reasonably regularly. Uh, but they, you know, as I said, they've never been a common species. Basking sharks. A lot of reports of basking sharks this year. Um, but not a lot. There's a few out of Plymouth. Um, they're nowhere near as common as when I remember we used to do the um, David Simmons used to do the tagging. Uh, the first one was seen on the 9th of April of Berry Head. Um, Samantha Barnes via Sea Watch um, saw, um, saw it. Um, and there's another one shortly after in Torquay Marina, whether it's the same fish, I don't know. Um, 15th and 16th of April. Um, firstly, there were three seen off the Isles of Scilly by the Isles of Scilly recorder and uh, Dr. Dr. Lambert of Sea Watch. Uh, on, on the 16th, there was one seen in Plymouth Sound by um, Jerome Shepherd. Uh, I don't know if they, I presume it was reported to the Shark Trust. Day after, um, Miraz Charters, um, Dave Uren saw one out by the Hands Deeps. He described it as a large specimen. Um, I mean, he's tagged them up to 33 foot, so he knows what a large specimen looks like. Uh, there was also another one seen by the Mewstone. I'm not sure that, what the timing was and whether it was actually the same fish. 20th and 20th, um, there's one seen in Woodsands Bay by Jerry Harris of the Shark Trust. And the 23rd, there was one seen by what I call the old wall out of Falmouth, which is basically the drop off um, by Alan Gillard. And again, it was reported to the Shark Trust. Then we go to the 1st of May, one seen off the Roseland by Catherine Smalley of the Shark Trust. Next day, another one seen on the Isles of Scilly. Um, 
but the, the, the early one, the last one seen was on the 25th of May off the Chesil Beach, and that was by the Shark Trust. Then we go through, there wasn't another one seen until July. Uh, another one seen off the Isles of Scilly by Scott Reed. Then the 10th, there was another one seen off the Isles of Scilly, this time by Julian Bra uh, Branscombe. Um, then the 27th and 29th, uh, 28th and 29th, there were baskers seen in North Devon, west of Wolf Rock, which is, those of you who don't know, is actually west of Penzance. And another one of Bossoni Cove, which, frankly, I don't know where that actually is, but it sounds very Cornish. And that was the last one reported for the year. Now the good one. This is particularly my favourite last year, which was caught by a friend of mine, Mar um, Owen Malia, um, a marbled electric ray. And a uh, lovely picture of it. It actually weighed quite, it was actually about 12, 13 pounds, which is big for a marbled electric ray. Um, as you can see from the back of it, uh, there are two leeches attached. And that pretty much gives away the marbled electric ray's of sedentary li um, lifestyle. Curiously, it was caught on a lure whilst they were drifting. So he basically must have dropped the lure into its mouth because they don't even have the sort of um, monkfish, the anglerfish's ability to just open and inhale. They, he must have just dragged it over it and it took it. Um, he did get a shock out of it. So um, he was feeling less than happy after he took 60, 70 volts. But he didn't ask me. He only sent this back and said, I'll take it. Take it. This is an electric ray. I'm sure it was. Spur dog. Um, they're getting increasingly common um, to the east of our region and to the far west. They seem to be absent from about the hands deeps to the lizard. They're very rarely encountered. Um, but from the east ruts and the west ruts, they're now very common. Um, we do see sexual segregation for most of the year. Um, large females tend to be away, away from the males. The males are a pesky creature who will follow you for a long period. The, the females seem to be in very specific regions where the males seem to be wider spread. Um, but we do, later on in the season, we do see males and females together, which probably suggests mating. Uh, there are species that's under, um, is still, I think it's probably, I think it's still actually, uh, the RUCN rating is um, is endangered, but there is, an, there is likelihood to be a fishery open in the UK within the next year or so. So that, I'm afraid, end, ends my talks. And so we'll get on to the interesting stuff, which is the turtles now. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, we'll pass back to Doug briefly before we go to uh, questions. <coughs> right. Well, the last few years, there have been very few turtle records, unfortunately. Or well, fortunately, seeing as a lot come are found dead. <clears throat> um, in 2022, hang on, sorry, there's a mistake there. That first record there should be 2022, not 23. Um, right, uh, three probable leatherheads, leatherbacks, was seen from the shore, Paul Scouts and Anthony's head uh, swimming along. So it tends to be most unidentified ones are likely to be um, leatherbacks. Um, so a decomposed one in April near Mavagissi, then one uh, seen off the manacles. One in the Bristol Channel, which is an unusual area for them, <coughs> was found entangled in pot ropes and fortunately released by the fishermen before it drowned or anything. So that was a, a good one. And then um, in November, the time you tend to get a few cold stunned loggerheads coming in, a very small loggerhead was found uh, on a beach at uh, the lizard. Here it is. Um, unfortunately, it was taken in on the uh, in mid November, and despite the efforts of Blue Reef Aquarium and Newquay, it did die of starvation on the tenth of December. 
just couldn't get it to get enough nutrition into it. But amazingly, all these goose barnacles hanging under its plastron. And when they were cut off, it was 230 grams of uh, goose barnacles being carried along by a poor little one pound turtle. So half his own weight, his or her own weight of um, goose barnacles being attached and causing a drag on that turtle. Uh, actually, one thing from this year, one caught January, uh, not caught, found, a loggerhead found on a beach in Cornwall in January, when it was taken into Blue Reef, had a Columbus crab, small uh, three centimeter crab, well, three centimeters, which is enormous for a Columbus crab, uh, normally about one centimeter. Um, and that was found under the carapace by the anus of a, a loggerhead this year. That was back in January, I think. Here's a quick summary. As I say, last year's uh, number for the Southwest, only seven records. Uh, 2020, of course, was COVID year when hardly anyone was out. We had five records there. Prior to that, around the 12 to 20 range is normal. So last year, not many, this year, even few. But that uh, mirrors the national situation. <coughs> um, normally, leatherbacks make the greatest proportion of the identified ones. And that is the same, but we did have this big reduction overall, both locally and nationally, of turtles last year. Uh, quite a lot, though, came in over the winter. Uh, mainly, I think there was one Kemp's, but otherwise mainly loggerheads, cold stunned, uh, come in and most have gone into rehabilitation. Well, as I say, not a great deal on the turtles this year, unfortunately, but uh, these are some of the people who've managed to give me records. I uh, had some re new records in just yesterday from Orca, which do in fact change a couple of the things that uh, uh, Simon said. <coughs> uh, they had the earliest basking shark on the 2nd of April, seen from the Salonian, and one of their uh, cross-channel surveys picked up one in September south of Lime Bay. Also, I forgot to pass on to Simon that one thresher was stranded at Perrinporth in December. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. So we'll go for questions now. Um, so there's a couple uh, that have appeared in the Q&A in the chat. If you'd like to ask one live, just a reminder to click on the raise hand icon, which you'll find on the bottom of your screen. Um, so there's one that I believe you already answered, uh, Doug, from Michael Pulston, which was what was the size of the red scorpion fish? Um, and you were saying it was about 30 centimetres. So for those of you that can't see I that. Can, but... Yeah, I, I can look at the photo. I didn't have the rights to show the photo, so I uh, couldn't show that. But uh, it was caught by a trawler off bricks. And I've got a photo of the crewman holding it. And it fills two hands. Excellent. Um, we've also got another one for you, Doug, from um, Keith, which was, was the streaked Gurnard occurrence the first recorded ever for British waters? No, <clears throat> they've been known, um, and I, in the days when I could go down the fish market regularly, I was seeing them from time to time. They tend to be a bit deeper, but they hadn't been recorded in Southampton waters before. So uh, uh, Robin Soames and his team, who do a lot of survey work on Southampton water, had never seen one before in that area. Um, they did actually go into the Cornwall Red Data Book as a very rare species because they were seldom seen uh, by anglers or divers, but in fact, the commercial boats were collecting them further out at sea. And I do see them coming in from that. But it looks like an eastward extension rather than a rarity for the country. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. So before we go to Bob, who's got his hand up, just one that I think is directed towards you, Simon, um, from Christine Hintner. Uh, why have mackerel become a winter species now? Uh, mackerels have been having a bit of a commercial fishing background. Mackerel have always been highly variable in where they go. I've never quite seen them as absent in the summer. I think probably if you look at places like Iceland, they now have a very viable commercial mackerel fishery. And, and they even extended to Greenland at one point. Norway are seeing more mackerel. Um, in fact, the mackerel numbers are quite high. The stock's quite high. It's just gone further north. And again, that might be climate. Um, it's very difficult to tell. But the last, I think 2016, they had a lot around in the summer. Um, was the last time i'll give you an idea um one of the shark boats was telling me he went two months without seeing a mackerel uh which i've never heard of before but um you know normally we get a reasonable amount out there but they were virtually totally absent last year i, I you know I, I think it's moved um mackerel have always done it but i've never quite seen them do it to this extent so it may be I mean, i'm always dubious to say it is climate related but yeah it is a possibility yes yeah, so gonna be my comment uh, there are lots more reports of them up around Iceland, so it does seem to be the population moved. Such a contrast from when I came to Plymouth in 1979 and working at the NBA, looking out my window, every day there was a, a line of boats coming in with their decks piled high, weren't even holds full. The decks were piled high with uh, mackerel in those days. I, I remember working on a Gurdy boat back in the mid 80s or something like that and there was so much caught we were getting like five p a kilo it wasn't even worth us going out there were so many landed but at a time this year the the price of mackerel was absolutely absolutely astronomical it went up to about nine pound a kilo excellent thank you i'm gonna um see if bob would like to um unmute and ask his question uh live otherwise i do think we've got it here we can read it out okay i think i'm gonna read it out so bob has said simon uh basking shark numbers still seem to be very low relative to 10 years ago do the shark trust numbers bear this out yes yeah, um, basking sharks were reasonably common during April, May and June out of Plymouth. We used to see them most days we went out. Um, I haven't personally seen one for a few years. Um, it may be there's more people looking for them than, than before. Um, it's very difficult to say. It's sort of effort might have increased, but I would say yes. Um, certainly in the southwest, basking sharks seem to, numbers seem to be lower. Excellent. And then Keith, uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, you seem to have your hand up. So you've got a question. Uh, thank you, Cathy. Um, yeah, in response to what Bob asked regarding basking sharks, um, I recall that the last time we were seeing any numbers of basking sharks out of Plymouth uh, was probably about 2011, uh, because I recall driving a boat and having two friends on board and saying, oh, you go in to photograph the basking shark. I'll do it another time. Well, there wasn't another time after that 2011 and uh speaking to david sims at the marine biological association uh you know he'll draw attention to the fact that for instance off the west coast of ireland where all those superb pictures were taken in recent years of circles of basking sharks they disappeared for 20 years and they come back again so they're out there somewhere is uh what i've frequently heard say and I suppose it's just one of those long term decadal scale variations with no obvious reason. Um, but be patient, they'll be back. Yeah, I remember uh, when I first started at the aquarium in uh, 98, Colin Speedy was always down in the southwest from April to May following the basking sharks. And then end of May, he'd go up to the west coast of Scotland, whereas and after about four years, he came down, and he couldn't find one, went off to the west coast of Scotland, and they all turned up the next week. <laughs> they can be very variable. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm going to take one last call then for any other questions, either raise your hand or pop those in the Q&A. Um, or any final words from yourself, Doug uh, or Simon? Yes, I would say sorry. Keith had asked me to say this, and I've forgotten until now. Um, looking at the small gobies, blennies, inshore fish, 
been reports of the black-faced uh, blenny breeding in the Portland area, but they seem to, and maybe showing up in Cornwall, but they seem to have disappeared from the South Devon coast. So anyone uh, listening, watching now, who's got records of black-faced blenny, if they could please let me have them and my email on the screen, and then um, very pleased to have those. And of course, also of things like variable blenny, cooches, Stevens, gobies, that kind of thing. We'd like to build up the picture of these, please. Just a, just a couple of points. I probably forgot to tell them to, um, to Doug. Um, I think I mentioned the fact there was a billfish scene off Lou during last autumn by, um, by da um, Dan Margots of Sawena. Um, which I thought was very interesting. He couldn't formally ID it. Um, it was fairly close. I'm thinking it's a broadbill swordfish, but um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there have been some very interesting um, billfish washed up on the beach. The other thing I would say is that the Coochies broom have extended. They are quite common in the Sound, uh, Sound for Drake's Island. Um, and they're also found on the, the bread, well, what I call Brendan's Reef, which is southwest of the Hands. Yes, they seem to have really taken over and well not taken over, come in in good numbers. There um, was a man who was, who was fishing from commercially in the sound, believe it or not. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I would regularly see them on the fish market when I was going down there. As you say, with a billfish, um, you can't tell unless you get a good photo or actually see the fish. But it's 90 plus percent of all billfish in British waters are the broadbill swordfish. Uh, had a few marlins and a couple of sail. Um, oh, got the name, the one with the big fin on the back, sailfin, and um, also one long billed spearfish. But they're anything other than swordfish is unusual, very unusual. Uh, it is really unfortunate that I can't actually talk to you because it's this year about the small tooth, small tooth ten, um, sand tiger that was uh, stranded at Leap Beach. <laughs> uh, we'll have to save that one for next year. <laughs> Excellent. That's a, that's a spoiler for next year then. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, lots, a uh, couple of comments in the chat to say thank you to both of you um, and how it's been fascinating. And we'll get the chat saved so that we've got those um, observations that people have popped in there available for anybody that um, or for the report for that to go back to back to the main body. So um, I'm just going to uh, thank you both. Um, thank everybody that's attended today for watching. And just to remind you um, that uh, information on the Marine Biological Association who've hosted today can be found on our website. Um, and this video will be available to uh, watch, or you may even be watching it right now on YouTube um, after the event. So thank you very much to everyone and we'll finish there. Right. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>